Southern Fried True Crime covers cases that are not suitable for young listeners, and there may also be some explicit language used. Listener discretion is advised. The case of Celeste Beard is infamous, so much so that I've resisted covering it. It's a ridiculously salacious case. A woman marries a man twice her age and then is too impatient to wait for him to die naturally. It's not just that her husband, Stephen Beard, gets lost in the lurid details of Celeste's tangled web. So does she. She is an empty vessel, devoid of empathy, of caring, of anything but greed. Over the years, Celeste was diagnosed with all sorts of psychiatric disorders. No one could ever help her because she hid behind a mask. She doesn't fit into any female archetypical boxes. Except, of course, that she's a black widow, a femme fatale. She is a caricature of a woman. But she was shaped by life, her own childhood, and then her early leap into adulthood. The more I read about her, the more intrigued I became. If you watch any crime shows, they often only skim the surface of who she really is. And often, they buy into her lies. Welcome to episode 135, The Infamous Case of Celeste Beard, Part 1. At 3 a.m. on October 2, 1999, 74-year-old Texas millionaire Stephen Beard called 911. Panicked and bewildered, he said, My guts blew out of my stomach. He didn't know what happened just that he was literally holding his intestines with his hands. A Travis County deputy was the closest to the scene. It was an opulent mansion in the exclusive Gardens of Westlake neighborhood, a gated community on Toro Canyon Road in Austin, Texas. He was soon joined by another officer and the captain of the Westlake Fire Department. The man on the 911 call said his wife was in another part of the house and asked the dispatcher to call her. The officers called into dispatch, but found no one had answered the phone, and now no one was answering the doorbell or their frantic knocks. Not wanting to wait, the officers walked around the back of the massive home until they were on a small patio. Through French double doors, they could see a large man holding a telephone receiver in one hand, with his other hand holding his stomach. The deputy had to bust through the glass to get inside Steve Beard's bedroom. When he asked, What happened to you? Steve said, I don't know. I woke up this way. Steve Beard was a very large man, and his wide abdomen looked to have been shredded. He was, quite literally, holding his guts in. Did you have surgery recently? Did you bust your stitches open? The deputy asked. No, Steve insisted. Before paramedics even arrived on scene, the deputy called Starflight, Travis County's own Life Flight emergency helicopter, to get Steve Beard to a hospital as quickly as possible. His injury was grave. His face was pale. It was amazing he was still alive at all. One of the officers made their way through the house so they could get open the door for the EMTs. As he walked through the living room, he found a woman and a teen girl coming from the opposite wing of the house. Eighteen-year-old Christina Beard had awoken to flashing blue lights. Her mother, Celeste, had been sleeping in her room. What's going on, she cried. Her mother said, someone's at the door, and then shoved the frightened teenager into the hallway, telling her to go find out what was going on. Christina ran into the guest room and called 911. The operator told her it was the police and EMS at her door, and that her father had called 911. As Celeste and Christina ran into the deputy, he told them there was a medical emergency and asked if Steve had had surgery recently. No, they both insisted. Christina tried to comfort her mother, who seemingly went into hysterics, screaming, Don't let my husband die! 
and then the teenager bravely walked into the master bedroom to see her dad. She couldn't get to her father, but she was able to look him in the eyes, and he said, Is your mother all right? She said, Yes. We love you. I love you. Her mother was just fine. She was now sitting on the porch steps, smoking a cigarette, as her teenaged daughter cried and kept running in to check on her dad. Later, officers and EMTs would give varying accounts of Celeste Beard's demeanor. She was frantic. She was calm. She was upset and demanding. She was crying. She was crying, but there were no tears, as one officer would later testify. Her husband of 10 years was hanging onto life. His injury was so grave that paramedics worked on him as they carried the stretcher out of the house, desperately applying gauze and tape, trying to hold in Steve's massive wound. Inside the master bedroom, one of the deputies noticed a yellow shotgun shell on the floor and declared the room a crime scene. Christina and the other officers were cleared out of the room as the deputy called in crime scene investigators. On the porch steps, with cigarette smoke billowing around her, the first deputy who had been on the scene walked past Celeste as she said, This is perfect timing. We were supposed to leave for Europe tomorrow. Austin is the state capital of Texas, an inland city, bordering the Hill Country region. Home to the University of Texas flagship campus, Austin is known for its eclectic live music scene, its many beautiful lakes and parks, and its diverse mix of just under one million citizens. Austinites are from all walks of life, college students, government workers, musicians, and of course, high-end tech workers that came with Dell Technologies. Founded in 1984 by Michael Dell, the company is the third largest personal computer vendor. California has Silicon Valley, Austin has Silicon Hills. The city's official slogan is the live music capital of the world, promoting its many musicians and live music venues, as well as the long-running PBS concert series, Austin City Limits. A Keep Austin Weird campaign began in the year 2000, aimed at protecting small local businesses from the large corporations moving in. Austin has also long been known as the City of the Violet Crown because of the gorgeous, colorful lights glowing across the hills after sunset. Stephen Beard Jr. moved with his wife to Austin in 1982 when he won a bid to found a new independent television station in the city. In the days before Fox and way before digital and streaming services, there were the three big networks and, in some cities, a local channel. Steve Beard would make his new station, called Bevo, after the University of Texas football's beloved mascot, a huge success. Born in Dallas in 1924, Steve never had a relationship with his own father, Steve Sr., at least as far as his own children ever knew. But he was close to his mother. He floundered a bit after high school, majoring in marketing and advertising. He eventually earned a chiropractic degree, though he never practiced. Instead, Uncle Sam came calling. He joined the Navy in World War II and trained as a pilot and engineer. After the war, work wasn't easy to find with so many soldiers returning to the workforce. He landed a job as a shoe salesman in the Neiman Marcus department store in Dallas, making $15 a week. He would later consider this job his biggest lucky break, as he met his future wife there, Elise Adams, who was a model for Neiman Marcus. Though maybe an odd couple in appearance, they were a very good match. Steve was always wide-shaped, though not as heavy then, and Elise was petite and beautiful. She may have been a knockout beauty, but she was also a tomboy. She rode horses, she loved to camp and fish, and she matched Steve's never-ending energy. He soon got a job at Dallas's KRLD Radio, a longtime dream of his. He literally worked his way up from sweeping the floors to becoming a top ad executive. Soon, he was producing TV commercials and was highly sought after in the industry. He was stable, but always hungry for the next big opportunity. As Steve climbed the corporate ladder, Elise made a home 
and bore him three children, starting in 1948 with Stephen III, daughter Becky in 1950, and their youngest son Paul in 1953. Steve was considered an old-fashioned Texas businessman. His handshake meant everything, and he built his fortune, buying nice homes, cars, and everything for his family while also frugally saving. He was in his late 50s when he won the Austin TV station bid. His children were grown. He and Elise moved to Austin and bought a home on Westlake Hills, situated on one of many of Austin's hillside bluffs with gorgeous views of the city skyline. The couple lovingly renovated the home into a real show place, almost 5,000 square feet. Nicknamed Lexisland, Steve and Elise had chosen one of the most beautiful and expensive neighborhoods in Austin, with the kind of privacy only his kind of money could buy. Known as Austin's Hollywood Hills, Sandra Bullock and Matthew McConaughey own homes nearby. They joined the Austin Country Club, where at the time a membership cost $50,000. Elise Beard never had trouble making new friends. She was as gregarious as her husband, and soon she reveled in winning golf tournaments at the club and had a huge circle of friends. Always athletic and young at heart, she fit right in. By then, Steve had gained a lot of weight. He loved to eat and drink, and it caught up with his body type. But Elise didn't care. And Steve didn't care either, and joked about his own weight, saying as long as Elise loved him, it didn't matter. By 1986, Steve brokered a deal to make his TV station a Fox affiliate. He and Elise were happy in their chosen home city. She bought him a dog, a sweet girl named Megan. The lab golden retriever mix followed Steve everywhere he went and slept at his feet at night. Their sons had moved away, but Becky was close by in Dallas. But in early 1993, the Beard's charmed life came to an end when Elise became ill. She had a brain tumor. She suffered terribly through chemo and radiation, and Steve never left her side. She was in remission by that summer, and the couple took a cruise for their 45th wedding anniversary. But in September, her cancer was back, and it spread quickly and unmercifully. Elise Adams Beard died the next month on October 13, 1993. Steve was almost inconsolable. He was a depressed man, admitting to a friend that he was a man who needed to be married. Steve Baird was the kind of man who wanted to take care of someone, and he had no taste for the wealthy older women who constantly hit on him. Rich widows looking for someone not out for their own money seemed to come out of the woodwork for a man like Steve Beard, but he wasn't interested. Those women didn't need him. He would soon meet one who did. Almost every night, Steve ate dinner at the Austin Country Club alone. He drank exactly two vodka martinis with dinner before he would quietly make his way home. Home to his beautiful, custom mansion, all too quiet and dark, without his beloved Elise. One night, he asked around the club if anyone on the wait staff would be interested in being his house manager. On top of losing the love of his life, Steve didn't know how to take care of a home. Elise did all that. She took care of the home, and he took care of her. Now he was lost. Maybe a housekeeper would help cheer up the gloominess of that big house and take care of his affairs. A 30-year-old waitress named Solis Martinez was all too happy to take him up on the offer. The pretty young blonde who approached the lonely millionaire had come a long, circuitous route to the Austin Country Club. Celeste Marie Johnson was born on February 13, 1963, in Los Angeles County. She was adopted at birth by Edwin and Nancy Johnson. The Johnsons had met late in life in Ohio in their mid-fifties after Edwin had left the Air Force. Both were religious and rather stuffy, so they seemed to have some things in common. They married and soon moved to Camarillo, California. Edwin opened a Volkswagen repair shop 
and the couple started trying to have children. But into their 50s, Nancy kept having miscarriages, and they soon knew that adoption was the only way they would have a family. So they put the word out, as Nancy later explained. This was before the pill and legalized abortion. So there were so many infants who needed homes and lots of ways around adoption laws. They adopted four babies in four years. A boy named Cole, then Celeste in 1963, when she was just two days old. Her sister Carice came less than a year later, followed by the youngest Johnson named after his father and called Eddie. On the outside, they seemed to be the perfect, traditional 1960s family. Hard-working father, loving but strict homemaker mother, and stair-step children. On the inside, Edwin had never come to terms with his own tragic upbringing. His father had taken his own life after the accidental drowning of Ed's brother. Nancy's upbringing is more obscure, but she did spend time in a psychiatric hospital when Cole was about five years old. He told author Catherine Casey that he remembered his mother holding the children underwater in the bathtub. She said she was rinsing their hair, but he remembered it as a frightening experience. Whatever really happened, Nancy was checked into a psych ward. She said she had a nervous breakdown, brought on by diet pills and exhaustion. With four kids under five years old, her exhaustion is understandable. But it wasn't just this incident that colored their lives. All the Johnson kids attended a private Christian school, even though already the Johnsons struggled financially. Things only grew worse when Edwin's business failed and he decided to go to college on the GI Bill instead of finding work. Resentment boiled over as soon Nancy was working two jobs to support the family. Of all the Johnson children, Celeste was daddy's girl. He adored her and so he seemed genuinely shocked and hurt when she later repeatedly accused him of molesting her. Celeste was 11 when her dad lost his business. She and her siblings all then enrolled in public school. A girl who had once been a gifted student began acting out, anything for attention, and it didn't take long for Nancy to kick Ed out of the house. Ed seemed to have been suffering some kind of breakdown himself. He had begun calling himself Jedediah, spouting a lot of biblical nonsense. Celeste's siblings would later agree that she changed in middle school when her parents divorced. She had always been the family instigator, but now she became more violent with her brothers. The Johnsons were also waging a brutal custody war for the kids. Eventually, the boys went to live with Ed, while Celeste and Carice stayed with Nancy. Celeste testified against her father about physical abuse, but not sexual. But still, she said he stabbed her in the face, but then claimed the scar had already faded once she was further questioned. Friends and family were baffled at her testimony. Nancy later said the cops were often called for Celeste's violence, including putting her fist through a window. She was given community service and ordered to go to counseling, but by then, Nancy claimed she was already taking her daughter to psychiatrists who couldn't figure out what was going on with the angry teen. By high school, Celeste was a knockout. Tall, long-legged, with blonde Farrah Fawcett hair and vivid blue eyes, she was very popular with the boys. And despite her behavior issues, she did well in school. She was on the varsity swim team as well as the debate team. But still, she was known as a wild child. And as soon as she got her driver's license, she tore down her neighborhood streets at breakneck speeds in her family's VW Bug. And though she dressed very conservatively, probably her mother's doing, she was already quite the femme fatale. Not merely promiscuous, she was purposely provocative. Other girls hated her, but the boys, boy did they love her. When she was 15 years old, she met a 17-year-old guy named Craig Bratcher in a bar. By then, Celeste had started skipping school. She smoked pot, hung out at the beach, and basically did whatever she pleased. So she and Craig moved in together, and by the time she was 17, Celeste was pregnant, with twins. In what would become a habit, Celeste began lying about her health. 
She told a friend that it was a miracle that she had become pregnant. A doctor had supposedly said she couldn't. Celeste would also later claim that Craig didn't want the babies and punched her in the stomach, trying to make her miscarry. She accused him of all kinds of abuse. But on December 6, 1980, when Celeste was seven months pregnant, she married Craig Bratcher in a small home ceremony. Though she had been advised to go on bed rest, she refused and gave birth to her twins two months early on February 6, 1981. Christina Ann and Jennifer Lynn, weighing less than three pounds, spent three months in the hospital, beginning on respirators to help them breathe. Once they came home, the young couple struggled, often living with friends, and their fights became epic. Craig would later admit to being an alcoholic, but said Celeste was violent. She threw things, and would often intentionally hurt herself and then blame him. He also said she frequently took off and left him with the babies. But she always came back, blaming her behavior on her childhood sexual abuse. She had now started claiming that her father raped her and one of her brothers molested her. Craig, always feeling sorry for her, would take her back. When she didn't want to have sex, he was frustrated, but understood. Later in life, Celeste would insist Craig had been a very abusive man who stalked her and raped her. He admitted to having a temper, and there was a police report and then a restraining order when he found her in bed with a neighbor. He saw them through a window, aimed a gun at them, and then broke the window. He spent four months in jail for brandishing a firearm. It came as no surprise when the young couple divorced in May of 1982, just 18 months after marrying, when the twins were barely over a year old. After their divorce, Celeste often left the babies with Craig and would take off. She moved in with a friend briefly, with the babies, but her friend soon became tired of being taken advantage of, and Celeste also had become weirdly possessive. When the friend moved out, Celeste called the cops, accusing her of stealing her purse. The purse was found on the side of the road, but it was just another link in the chain of lies Celeste would tell about the people in her life. More interested in partying, she gave up Christina and Jennifer to foster care. It is fair to say that she was an incredibly young mother, and one without much of a support system. Though she and her mother would later collect in her own life, Nancy was never in the twins' lives. In fact, Celeste told them she was dead at one point. She and Craig reunited briefly, long enough for her to regain custody of the twins. Her father, Ed, even came to live with them to help out with the young couple. Which seems odd, since she later said she told Craig he had raped her. Whether or not that was true, Ed had gotten his life together, and as a father who had been overwhelmed with four young children, he sympathized with the couple. Until he stayed out late one night and the next day discovered Celeste had called the cops on him. She again accused him of sexually abusing her. But Edwin Johnson insisted on his innocence, to the point of taking a lie detector test in 1985. He passed and was never charged with any abuse. After that, her siblings never really believed her stories. They didn't know their father as anything but passive. It was their mother who was controlling and abusive. Suffice it to say, Celeste's childhood is still somewhat of a mystery. Her siblings and mother spoke to author Catherine Casey, usually disputing everything Celeste had claimed, although her mother wouldn't outright deny the sexual abuse allegations. What is painfully obvious is Celeste's problems with motherhood, both with her own mother and with her twins. She never had the chance to connect with her birth mother as a child. And while Nancy and Ed adopted her at two days old, Nancy was never considered a nurturing woman. Never mind the bathtub incident, Nancy was just not motherly. She was not affectionate. Later, Celeste's own daughters would say the same thing about their mother. Maybe it was because they spent the first three months of their lives in the hospital. Celeste didn't hold her babies for a while and missed a maternal connection that is crucial. Not only was she a teenaged mother, she had difficulty forming an attachment to the girls. She often left them with friends, supposedly for an afternoon, and then would disappear for days. Neighbors often called child services on Celeste. The babies were neglected, often found dirty and hungry. 
Jennifer would later say some of her earliest memories of being with Celeste were of always being hungry. Over the next few years, Celeste would remarry twice, once to an Air Force man named Harold Wolfe. He treated her and the twins well, helping her regain custody when they married because the state had taken them away again. He would later say that although Celeste could seem very sexual, she never really actually seemed to enjoy sex. She treated it like a chore. And when Harold would get frustrated about their sex life, she would tearfully explain that she had been sexually abused by her father and brother. And Harold felt sorry for her. Of course he did. And he loved her. But life with Celeste was unbearable. She picked fights and then would scream abuse and then beg her way back into Harold's heart. After a particularly ugly fight when Celeste had threatened suicide, she willingly checked into the psychiatric ward of the hospital on the base where he worked. She was diagnosed with depression and put on medication. She seemed to try for a while, but then Harold got a transfer to Okinawa, and she had a fit when she was told she couldn't go with him because she had been on the psych ward. She called his superiors furiously until they withdrew the transfer. Harold learned his lesson after a couple of years of fights, threats of suicide, and Celeste almost ruining his career. He felt lucky to be given a second chance when he was transferred to Iceland, though he felt bad about leaving the twins. And then he came back and found out he was $60,000 in debt. And that was it. But Celeste was already on to her next husband, Jimmy Martinez. From the beginning, they had an intense attraction. His money didn't hurt either. Celeste always moved up the food chain with each husband. Jimmy worked as a manager for a security management firm. When he was transferred to Austin, Texas, the twins were 11 and were left alone to pack up the house. By now, Celeste and Craig had been fighting for custody. Craig could see what she was doing to his daughters, and it killed him. This time he won. But Celeste had started to get into young Christina's head. Christina had always felt responsible for her mother. Celeste now told her she was her favorite daughter and she couldn't live without her. When the girls went to visit their father for two weeks, before custody was even settled, Celeste flew into Washington trying to scoop them up. Jennifer refused, but Christina went with her mother. For the first time, the girls were separated. Once custody was finalized, Celeste was ordered by a judge to send Christina back to Craig. But Christina, torn by her mother's guilt trips, refused to board a connecting flight and flew back to her mother. Jennifer was despondent. Craig was also heartbroken, but he refused to force Christina. Instead, he and Jennifer made a life together in Washington State. Meanwhile, Celeste and Jimmy set up house in Austin and fell into Celeste's usual pattern of turmoil. And then Celeste was called back to Arizona to face charges of fraud. She had ruined so many lives in Arizona, including that of a couple who had even taken custody of the girls for a while. She had robbed their house and then told them to pad the insurance claim. Even though police were suspicious that it was someone who knew the couple, they didn't want to believe it was the young mother. And then Celeste got pissed at them and accused the husband of sexually assaulting her. Celeste had learned from an early age that sexual assault allegations were taken very seriously. But by this time, her own lies and schemes caught up to her. The couple, Lou and Gary Thompson, knew that Celeste had torched her own Ford Taurus car in the desert and then filed a false insurance claim. It was how she had talked them into filing their own false claims. She had made it seem so easy. After the assault allegation, they turned her in for everything. The assault charge was dropped, but because the Thompsons had admitted to insurance fraud, Phoenix police refused to charge her with the burglary of their house. However, they did find her Taurus in the desert. So after Celeste had settled in Austin, this was the fraud charge she was called back to Phoenix to face. She managed to get a sympathetic judge who just gave her probation and told her to pay $20,000 in fines. After she promised that she lived in Austin now, his court would never see her again. She was now Texas's problem. 
She sure was. And it wasn't long before Jimmy Martinez caught her ruining his credit as well. She had charged tens of thousands of dollars in their names. He tried calling credit card companies and explaining it wasn't his debt, but she was his legal wife. So her debts were his. He did try to work things out with Celeste, but she always took off, taking Christina with her. They were back and forth for quite a while. As with Harold, she agreed to see a psychiatrist. She had stabbed herself in the wrist with scissors, another suicide threat. She again was put on medication for depression, but it didn't last. She accused Jimmy of domestic abuse, and he spent a night in jail, though she had the charges dropped. She and Jimmy had an explosive relationship. Unlike her other two husbands, she did actually enjoy sex with Jimmy. So they did the push and pull for a while. Until Celeste got a job at the Austin Country Club in the fall of 1994. Within weeks, she had met Steve Beard. She took the job as house manager, essentially a housekeeper. But soon, it was obvious Celeste didn't know how to take care of a house. More like she didn't want to. But she couldn't cook. She didn't clean. And she sent out all his laundry to be washed and secretly hired maids. But it didn't take her long to win Steve over. He began taking her out socially, and she would even openly joke to his friends that she was his housekeeper, except she couldn't cook, didn't like to clean, and didn't know how to iron. Steve's friends laughed politely, inwardly worried for their friend. But no one wanted to tell him that this woman, almost half his age, didn't seem right. To be fair, Steve seemed happy again. Celeste was the balm he needed to soothe his grief. Most of his friends thought this was a dalliance, that it wouldn't last, that there was no need to worry. Privately, she was laughingly blunt. When Christina asked her why she was with Steve, after all, she had liked Jimmy, Celeste told her, Steve's rich. Steve's kids didn't hear much about her at first. Becky was the first to meet her. Celeste claimed that she had a degree in accounting from Pepperdine University but that she had gotten bored with that career. Becky was suspicious of Celeste's motives from the very beginning. Even Craig Bratcher, who when he called to talk to Christina once, tried to warn Steve, but Steve wouldn't listen. And Celeste did seem to have his best interests at heart. When Steve's doctor became worried about his blood pressure and asthma, he ran some tests and found that Steve's heart was enlarged. He was at risk of a heart attack. Celeste cheerfully put Steve on a diet and started walking with him. He quickly dropped 50 pounds of his over 300-pound frame. And it wasn't just Celeste. Steve was coming to really love Christina. His own children were grown, but he had loved being a dad. This felt like a whole new lease on life. A lovely, young, and fun new wife and a teenaged daughter. A new daughter who desperately needed a father. Christina had bounced from man to man with Celeste. She loved her dad, but had always chosen to live with Celeste to her own detriment. She had learned never to get too close to anyone because they probably wouldn't be around for long. But Steve won her over. He helped her with her homework, talked to her all the time, drove her to school in the morning as Celeste slept in. It may have been the allure of a new family even more than the seductiveness of Celeste that really won Steve over. He built a house on the south shore of Lake Travis, and soon he and Celeste were engaged. His children were really worried. They even called and got the advice of a close friend, a judge in Dallas named Harold Entz, about whether or not they might should try and get power of attorney. He pointed out that Steve was a smart man, and they had to trust that he knew what he was doing. They all agreed, but with trepidation. And Steve was no fool. He had a prenuptial agreement drawn up. At the time, his net worth was almost $12 million. Steve would retain ownership of his home and lake house if they stayed married for three years, and Celeste would be entitled to a one-time payment of $500,000. If she stayed with him until he died, he would double that to $1 million. Considering his fortune, that was fair to Steve. And it was more than fair to a hustler like Celeste. More money than she had ever had in her life. On February 18, 1995, 
32-year-old Celeste married 70-year-old Steve in a civil ceremony that took place in the main dining room in the Austin Country Club, where Celeste had once waited tables. With no friends of her own, her maid of honor was a woman who was married to an attorney friend of Steve's. This woman had been friends with Elise, too. Many thought it was odd, and I wonder why she didn't just have Christina stand up with her. Later, Celeste would tend to befriend people who were not in the same social class as her, at least the new Celeste Beard. It was people who worked for her, like her hairstylist and manicurist. She felt more comfortable with them. Becky was Steve's only child to attend the wedding. Paul had joined the Navy, like his father, and was out on a ship. Steve III evidently just chose not to come. So Becky watched with a sinking heart. She wanted her father to be happy. The age difference wasn't really the problem. Celeste Martinez just seemed fake to her. Friends whispered about this flashy new wife privately, but clapped Steve on the back jovially to his face. And after honeymooning in New Orleans, the couple settled into a routine. That month, in March 1995, before they were even married for 30 days, Christina saw her mother crush pills and put them into Steve's food. Steve, a great cook, always made dinner. But Celeste set the table and served. When Christina asked her what she put in his food, Celeste told her it was sleeping pills. I can't stand being here with that fat fuck. This way, he'll have a couple of drinks and pass out, and then I can go out. And this became their routine. Austin might be a big city, but it was a small town in elite circles. Soon Steve's friends got word of Celeste partying at night. But no one would tell him. No one wanted to hurt him, much less risk his friendship. Steve was a good man and a good friend, and it hurt his friends to keep quiet. But at this point, they were more worried he would cut them out of his life. And then it started. Celeste's bullshit with money never took too long. Steve was outraged to find out that their checking account was overdrawn. No matter what he gave her, credit cards, jewelry, cars, it was never enough. Suspicious, he went to check his safe deposit box. Sure enough, Elise's jewelry was missing. His friend at the bank, who always handled his affairs, looked into it. Celeste had been in the box twice that May, barely three months married, and she was stealing his dead wife's jewelry. He threw Celeste out of the house and hired a divorce lawyer. He brought their prenup to the first meeting with Celeste. She was distraught and wrote him a letter explaining about her debt in Arizona of $20,000 and said she was desperate. She explained that she pawned the jewelry to help pay it down and gave him the pawn tickets. And then she promised to get help. It was the same thing she had done with her other husbands. She always promised, but never followed through. But this time, she did check herself in for psychiatric treatment. She was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. She promised to stay in therapy and take medication. But Steve still filed for divorce right after she got out of the hospital in June. But by August, he had taken her back, just like all the men before him. Maybe he was embarrassed. He had to know people had whispered about his young wife. So maybe it was pride. And maybe he didn't want to lose Christina. Once he got all of Elise's jewelry back from the pawn shops, he also paid off Celeste's insurance fraud debt and withdrew his petition for divorce. And now Celeste had learned a lesson. Steve was no fool. She might have wiggled her way back in this time, but she realized that not only did she have to be careful, she needed to renegotiate. Her first order of business was to get him to sell his home. It was the house he and Elise had bought when they first came to Austin. The house they had painstakingly remodeled and carefully decorated with all their souvenirs from traveling around the world. But if Celeste could talk him into buying a new house, it would be community property, half hers, no matter what. Steve, a thoughtful man, realized that Celeste may have seen his home as Elise's home. He put aside his own feelings and put the house up for sale. 
He sold it to a man named Richard Oppel, a D.C. newspaper man who was coming to Austin to take over as editor of the Austin American Statesman, the city's daily paper. Keep Richard Oppel's name in your back pocket. It will be important later. Steve, Celeste, and Christina now moved into the small lake house, along with his faithful dog Megan and Celeste's spaniel Nicky. The house wouldn't seem that small to us, a nice three-bedroom, two-bath, but it was quite a downsize for them. But it would do, as Steve planned to take over all the planning of their new home. He wanted to model it after Frank Lloyd Wright's famous Falling Water, a mansion built over a waterfall. Steve found an architect, and they made fast friends, which was good, because Steve proved to be more than hands-on. Even after the design was complete, Steve was there for almost every day of its construction. And Celeste was working her magic. In early 1996, Steve met with his lawyer and drew up a new marital agreement. When he died, Celeste would now get $1 million, as well as half interest in the lake house and half interest in the new mansion they were building on Toro Canyon Road. As Celeste went on shopping sprees during the day, Steve threw himself into building their dream home. He had never really been satisfied with retirement. He had been a hard-working man all his life. Now he had a new purpose, a new dream. Whatever reservations he had, he kept to himself. And Celeste began ramping up the second part of her plan. She had no intention of just waiting out the three years for only half a million. Remember, she only got one million if she stayed married to him until he died. She and Steve always had a nightly ritual of cocktails. They were both vodka drinkers, though Celeste insisted on top-shelf Stoli for herself, while Steve bought himself the cheap stuff, a brand called Wolfschmidt, normally used as a well vodka by bartenders. Now, she started pouring out his Wolfschmidt and replacing it with Everclear, pure grain alcohol. Instead of his normal two drinks of 80-proof martinis, now he was drinking 190 proof unknowingly. It wasn't just to make Steve pass out quicker. She was well aware of his age and heart issues. After all, she had lovingly put him on a diet when they were still dating on his doctor's orders, when Steve's blood pressure and enlarged heart had made his doctor worry. Laughing, she told her friends all about his Everclear cocktails. She called them the graveyard. Southern Fraud True Crime is written, hosted, and produced by me, Erica Kelly. Today's episode was researched by the one and only Haley Gray. Southern Fraud's original music is by Rob Harrison of Gamma Radio, and the original graphic art is by Coley Horner. Friends, I hate to do this again, but I am splitting this case into two episodes. They say everything is bigger in Texas, and it seems like every time I have to do a two-parter, it's a Texas case, so I guess they're right. I'll be back after Thanksgiving with part two. I really appreciate you sticking with me. Please submit case suggestions to southernfriedtruecrime at gmail.com. I do not accept suggestions on social media, and I apologize if I'm unable to answer your email. I get dozens of suggestions a week, and it takes time to go through and check out each case. I will definitely contact you if I plan to use the case you submit. Thank you all so much for sending in these suggestions. I truly get my most interesting cases from listener suggestions, so keep them coming. And don't forget to come find our Facebook group. Search for Southern Fried True Crime Fans Discussion Group. We worship our patron saint, Dolly Parton, share fun memes and delicious recipes. Our group is a safe and fun corner of Facebook, and by God, we mean it when we say no shit ass is allowed. It's not just a motto, it is how we run the group. If you enjoyed today's show, don't forget to subscribe and please tell a friend or rate and review on iTunes. I'm also on most large platforms like iHeart, Stitcher, and Spotify, as well as Stitcher Premium, where you can listen ad-free. Until next time. Thanks so much for listening. Y'all take care.